I'll go hide. Why? Because they mask so much around them. Like seriously, it takes social camouflaging to the next level and I don't want you to witness it because you know me so well. I mean, I also act differently around my coworkers. It's not a big deal. I don't mean code switching or acting a bit more professional. I mean, I'm a whole other character and it takes more spoons and frankly more alcohol than I'm willing to consume to sustain it. Okay, let's both hide. Do you ever wonder why the rates of unemployment and substance use and loneliness are much higher in the neurodivergent community as opposed to everybody else. Masking is just one of those reasons, but let me paint a scenario for you. Let's say you have a job, you don't necessarily like it, but it pays the bills, it gets the job done. You wanna quit this job, and you wanna quit this job because you wanna return back to yourself. You realize that the person that you're putting out there is not an authentic representation of who you are, and it makes it harder for you to build self-esteem because you're not putting an accurate version of yourself out there. That's masking. It's something that we don't want to do, but it's something that's done for survival. In order to understand why neurodivergent individuals sleep like this, we have to talk about proprioception. So this is the sensory information that you're receiving from your body. This is why I can close my eyes and I can take my finger, my pointing finger, and point to my nose without opening my eyes. Because I'm grounded, I know where I stand. A lot of neurodivergent individuals struggle uh, with sensory issues, obviously. You might feel clumsy, you might feel like you're not grounded, you might not feel like you have full control over your body. So, a way of getting that proprioceptive input is by, you know, sleeping like this. Even like that, sleep in some sort of way, maybe using a, a weighted blanket, uh, maybe having a big teddy bear. But these are all ways that you can self-soothe. Uh, and it's something that we, we do as neurodivergent individuals. High versus low masking in autism and ADHD. This is my mom and this is me. My mom is high masking and I am low masking. I stim publicly and always have, but my mom only does in private. I don't notice or care what others think of me, but my mom does. If you've ever wondered why women with ADHD and autistic women have to wait so long for a diagnosis, this video shows you a little bit of why that wait can be so long. On the right hand side, you saw the son stimming in public, doing his thing, not caring too much about other people's thoughts and opinions or feelings. On the left hand side, you saw the mom masking, deeply caring about what other people think. And this is probably something that she's been doing her whole life. And women are often rewarded for masking and accepted for that. So it makes it hard to show your true self. And this can often delay diagnosis and the right help. It's still processing that I'm autistic and it's huge news because I'm in my thirties and it all makes sense now. So I do feel like, I, I don't know, I feel relieved. Because a common question that I get is, what's the point of pursuing an ADHD or an autism diagnosis? Is it going to change me? I've been living this way my whole life. So what does a diagnosis do for me now that I'm in my 30s or 40s? And I think a diagnosis is important because all a diagnosis is is a word, right? A word or a term that better explains the majority of your symptoms. And when you can do this, you can take the pressure off of yourself. The way people feel is important. And now instead of hating yourself and saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm lazy, I'm motivated. You know, I have a hard time talking to people. I, I'm, I'm an outsider. Now you can say, I have autism and there's nothing wrong with that. I have ADHD and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm bipolar, schizophrenic, yeah, so on and so forth. And when you have a term that better explains the majority of your symptoms, you can begin the process of finding out different ways to love and appreciate yourself. Because if you're diagnosed later in life, there's a good chance that you spent your formative years being frustrated with who you were as a person and not liking who you are. So now we need a new way to live. And this way is going to start with us appreciating ourselves. I took Adderall for the first time yesterday. And what the fuck? I spent so many years thinking that I was a lazy person that I lacked the willpower that other people have to do certain tasks. Cause that's what when I tell you that I've seen grown men cry, not just cry, but cry, really cry, after getting an ADHD diagnosis, it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see in the clinic. Uh, you go from blaming yourself and feeling stupid and lazy and unmotivated to realizing that you have a condition which affects your ability to do 
Now you get the right help, uh, stimulants, whether it's Adderall, Vyvanse, Concerta, whatever, uh, and your brain is quiet for the first time. Uh, and I can relate. Uh, I was 26 when I got diagnosed with ADHD, and I'll never forget going into uh, my then girlfriend's apartment. Uh, and for the first time, I opened up my laptop and I started doing my work. Normally, I would watch three hours of uh, Chris Johnson, Titans football highlights, but I was able to focus for the first time, and it was awesome. So when I got medicated for ADHD, baby, my autism began to shine through. Why does autism become so much more prominent after you treat the symptoms of ADHD? So this is a really interesting question, and I've been seeing this more online and also clinically uh, in practice. And I want to say between the two conditions, ADHD and autism, I believe ADHD is the more boisterous of the two conditions. It's the more, it's a louder one, let's just say that. You can be hyperactive, you can be impulsive, uh, and you more so kind of feel the ADHD, meaning that the ADHD symptoms are kind of what brings you into the office because you're having such a hard time regulating your attention and your mood and you feel like you can't get anything done, you feel like you're stuck. It's funny because autism can cause a lot of these similar issues, but that's why I think it's so important to get an ADHD assessment because you never know where you go from there. Reasons why autistics tend to be very loyal partners. Number one, not understanding flirting. Autistic people tend to not understand social cues, and this definitely applies with flirting too. It is really hard for me to tell if someone else is flirting with me, so I don't even process it as an advance. Number two, honesty. I feel very uncomfortable with lying. If you're autistic, does this mean that you're more loyal in a relationship? Let's talk about it. So we know that when you're autistic, you could struggle to pick up on social cues. So somebody could be flirting with you. Somebody could be trying to do the makey fakey with you. And you may not understand what's going on until after the fact. And you're like, hmm, I think that person kind of liked me a lot. Likewise, if you have a deep sense of justice, you may struggle lying to people that you really care about. However, I have seen some evidence that suggests that autistic people, when compared to neurotypical people, are more likely to engage in consensual, non-monogamous relationships and polyamorous relationships. And what does that tell you? Or what does that tell me? It tells me that autistic people, even though we say that they may struggle to communicate, they're pretty good at communicating some of the difficult things. You need a lot of honesty. You need a lot of communication to make a polyamorous relationship work or a non-traditional relationship work. And it seems that autistic people are capable of doing this and might excel at non-traditional relationships. So I think that's, I think that's quite interesting. All right, y'all, so in this video, we're gonna talk about why autism can look a lot like anxiety. And this is why people sometimes are misdiagnosed or diagnosed later in life. So in this video, we're talking about PDA, which is pathological demand avoidance. This woman calls it persistent drive for autonomy. That's a really cool way of making it a bit easier for people to understand. So the PDA symptoms, uh, frequently being overwhelmed, not liking when people are watching you do things, this can manifest and look a lot like anxiety. And when you go to a clinician who is not familiar with autism, uh, which most a lot of clinicians aren't, they may diagnose you with anxiety, give you anxiety medications, SSRI, and it can help out, but it's not getting to the root of the problem. So these videos are really important because it helps to educate all of us, patients and providers. I don't think people understand how much autism affects the everyday tasks, the things that we take for granted, being able to get a haircut, being able to be in a loud airport without being overstimulated. Those are all things that when you're autistic, especially when you have sensory difficulties, those are the things that become overbearing and sometimes impossible. So a big shout out to the barber here. I see him work on that lineup. It's coming at the forum. I can tell by the time that the haircut's done, little buddy's gonna look really good. And I know from my work with autistic kids that sometimes something as simple as brushing somebody's hair can send them into behavior. And it could be the precursor to aggression and a lot of frustration. Type is neurodivergent. I just told her, me, a neurotypical, when I go to sleep, my brain uh, goes, it powers down right along with my body. And I see it. 
If you're neurodivergent and you're in a relationship with somebody who's neurotypical, please go back and watch this entire video. But also do understand that there are many differences between the neurodivergent individuals and neurotypical individuals. And one of those is sleep or the lack of sleep, insomnia. You have to understand that neurodivergent individuals, a lot of them, the overwhelming majority struggle with insomnia, struggle with something that we call delayed sleep phase disorder, which is where your average bedtime is about two hours later than the neurotypical person. So if you're in a relationship with somebody and they don't struggle with this and they're able to get to sleep on time and you're two-stepping and, and shuffling in the bed, it can make for a pretty interesting relationship, but it doesn't mean that it's impossible.